Welcome to Public and Private Fashions, a documentary series on artists and artisans living and working in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Hi, I'm your host, David Zoffoli, Executive Director of Creative Haverhill. Like every town and city, Haverhill has a vibrant community of artists and artisans that make up a creative workforce. These are professionals in a variety of fields, marketing, architecture, design, performing arts and music, visual arts and crafts, film, gaming, publishing, and cultural preservation. You may be familiar with some of these folks and there are others who for one reason or another have mostly kept their talents hidden from the public eye and you'll find out why. One thing's for sure, public and private passion for the arts is all around us. In public and private passions, we'll take a behind the scenes look at the passion that drives people to make something from nothing. It's a first-hand look into the creative process, and fortunately for us, creativity is everywhere. Today, we're visiting Richard Alexander and Michael LaFosse from Origamido, Inc. in Haverhill. Their work has been seen in museums and galleries around the world, including the Louvre in Paris and the storefronts of Hermes and Saks Fifth Avenue. They've authored over 70 titles on art and origami and operate a commercial design studio. Let's join them in that studio. The word origami is, uh, as many people know, a Japanese word. Oru means to fold, kami means paper, you put it together, it's origami. But it is the art of folding paper. So all of the techniques are concerned with folding only. You do not need scissors or cutting. You may use more than one piece but um, it's only folding. As a hobbyist with paper folding in initially, it was simply learning how to fold some clever little things from books in the library. But when I was 13 years old, I learned about the existence and the work of origami master Akira Yoshizawa. This wonderful article in the Reader's Digest magazine explained how this, um, this Japanese man devoted his life to the art of paper folding. He invented new origami, he created artful pieces that were extraordinary. They really changed my life. And as I began to practice more that way that he was doing, as I read it in the book, I realized that what I was doing was quite similar to the study of Judo and Taekwondo. There was a discipline to it, there was an art, there was a refinement, there's this long distance in the future, attainment somehow, but never really quite getting there, always walking the path. And I decided that the word origami was not going to tell enough of the story, so I thought origami do, the way of folding paper. The origami do studio was uh, uh, first opened on Wingate Street in November of 1996, mm -hmm. but I met Michael in 1988 and although I had done quite a bit of paper folding, thanks to a German teacher that I had in elementary school, I had never seen the likes of the artwork that Michael had done until I met him. And I thought, oh my gosh, you have this beautiful sculptural work in shoeboxes. It needs to be out where the public can see it. And he is uh, the only origami artist that uh, makes his own paper for his art. So it's custom paper. And I was so intrigued by that because of my background in chemistry and biology that I did everything that I could to help him. I came here because of the river. I'm trained as a uh, systems ecologist and limnologist. My specialty was freshwater ecosystems and estuaries. And the lower Merrimack River was just a fascinating place because it had been basically killed by tanneries and leather processing textile mills and uh, used to turn color, but it was on its way back because of federal funding and other programs. 30 wastewater treatment plants were built along the Merrimack River and I was actually involved in an operation to do salmon farming and trying to bring the Atlantic salmon back. I was also interested in flying on the water. I built a little retractable amphibious uh, ultralight down at Red Slavitt's uh, seaplane base in 1985-86. Uh, and I first was on the cover of the Haverhill Gazette probably around, I don't know, 83 or 85, somewhere like that, windsurfing on the Merrimack. No one had seen that before. Yes, right, uh, right. I was so impressed by uh, the potential of Haverhill. Um, 
I had never been in a place where people had this beautiful river resource but didn't use it, where people didn't hike and jog and walk their dogs along the river the way they did in Manhattan. So I just felt that Haverhill was a, a, a gem in the rough and that it would be an exciting time to be here. I found my voice through paper folding. There were many other art forms. I had dabbled in drawing and painting, flute playing. I'm actually a biologist by training, but paper appealed to me. And when I realized that that was my voice, then I had uh, a tool to express myself. And in the early years of my inventing origami, the necessity was that I would get the books out of the library and didn't find instructions on how to fold a bat or a shark or these other subjects. Or if those subjects were there, they weren't to my satisfaction for the kind of detail that I wanted or the style. So I began to stumble and it's like throwing yourself in Paris and you don't speak or understand or can't read French, but then you bumble around and you, you, you get thrown around and then it, then it eventually gets to you. So you end up being able to, um, to speak and learn and read French over years. That's how I taught myself the language of origami. Hmm. When I became fluent at it, it became simply a matter of imagining what the thing might look like and then I knew how to fold it. It is engineering, after all. And like musical notation, composers who are very uh, um, uh, fluent in, in musical composition, they can imagine an entire orchestral score in their head, mm -hmm. so it's said. Mm -hmm. So they, they know how the parts have to fit together and they can, they can hear what they want and they know how to notate it. And so it's the same thing. When Michael is um, developing a piece, or making some decisions, it's very crystal clear to me what is successful and what isn't. I'm um, the guy that arranges many of these pieces. Michael folded the elements and basically threw them in a cardboard box and I said, oh, I think I'll make this type of a composition and I'll put that together and, and that kind of is more expressive of um, what I was feeling than God knows what he was feeling when he was folding each flower. It's language. So many of us work within languages um, because we're taught them. You know, we're all speaking English now. Other languages include musical notation and, and you know, music theory and so forth, certainly numbers. When you become fluent in a language, you can really become, um, I would say, more than creative. You can start to get the big picture. And so you don't have to struggle anymore to forge what it is you're trying to express. It comes immediately to the fingers. People come to us all the time and they say, well, I could never do that. I'm not creative. Yeah. The fact is, maybe they don't know enough to be creative. Maybe you need to take an introductory course in art. A lot of people don't know um, was possible because they haven't been exposed to some very basic skills. I hate to use that old saw, but I will. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. Invention, invention speaks for creativity in that regard. And, and whenever we hear that expression, we often think of an emergency. I didn't have what I needed, so I, I, I had to improvise. And then there, all of a sudden, the person's forced to be creative. But um, the needs of a person's expressive uh, effort that's a need. Now paper folding is pretty simple. You just take a piece of paper and you crease it. Now you've made two folds because one side is a mountain, the other side is a valley. The process itself is pretty simple, so everybody can do it. Origami does not have to be complex in order to be interesting. And when you uh, ask, you know, is everybody creative? Well, some people don't have curiosity. They're not interested in things. And I think an artist is just perpetually interested in things. Elegance in origami is efficiency and no distracting creases. So that when you look at it, the whole form that's finished, all the planes, all the lines, everything should look like it's supposed to be there. And sometimes people will fold things and they end up looking tortured. They're bundled, bunched, and lots of papers lost up inside just to get it out of the way for no other good reason than to get it out of the way. And those things are not elegant. They're not fun to fold. They're not nice to look at. But then there's the expressivity. You can fold something to a fair thee well that has all of the geometric things in the right place, and then it looks dead. It looks like it was hammered 
flat out, I mean by a machine or something, and it just doesn't have the spark of life. So the touch of the artist needs to be there as well. And doing both of those well, from the design concept all the way up to the final execution, assuming you've got the correct paper for what you're doing, um, that is a triumph when it's done well. That combination of expression and elegance is something that Michael excels at. When we've gone around the world and have seen origami designed by artists from different countries, the first thing that hits me right in the face about that is their nationality shows up. And they couldn't help but put it there. They didn't know they were putting it there. I come from the United States and I look at a Japanese person's folded pieces and first of all, it is, these are definitely Japanese designs. You go to France, these are definitely French pieces. These are definitely Spanish pieces. When you get to know the person better, and then you'll start to see what is in that piece of origami art that is uniquely from that individual. And so I feel that the things that I produce must also do the same thing, whether I do it on purpose or otherwise. If you're talking about a finished piece, Wilbur the piglet is the one for me. <laughs> and Wilbur, um, it's I, I'll, I folded just that one piglet. I'll never do another one. It, it took him a whole month. I went to the Topsfield Fair, watched the little piglets running around, did little sketches, and just watched them. And then I invented a way to fold a pig. Now I said, well, okay, you know, it's, it's going to make the shape of a piglet. But what happened was, after I made the right kind of paper, so it had the right foldability, the right color, the right texture to represent the, the little piglet's skin, I folded it. And this is one of these rare events for me where I don't remember doing it. I have a few pieces, my goldfish, uh, which you know, basically a few exist, and, and my Wilbur the piglet and a few others where it's more of a almost like a Zen experience I don't know how else to explain it but I I do all the prep and the engineering I do the inspiration I go and take in whatever it is I wanted to learn about these things and then it comes through my hands and there it is so I'm, I'm done folding Wilbur and and there he is and it has the expression of he's just trotting across the, the barnyard happy and looking forward to who knows what Emerald. Absolutely. Literally. Too, it's used too <laughs> often and often overly oh, misused. Drives me nuts. Wait. Seashells. Seashells, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sunshine. My house is a passive solar. <laughs> A bad attitude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Boy. Oh, boy. Um, people that think things can't be done because it's always been done a different way. I love the sound of pebbles, the chatter clatter of pebbles rolling in the surf. And you get right at the shoreline, right where the water rolls them around. I love that. Yeah. Oh, I love the sound of water. I uh, love it in all of its forms, from taking a shower to, you know, swimming in the ocean. Screaming babies. <laughs> <laughs> that click before my furnace goes on. <laughs> I would love to be a flute builder, the kind that works building concert flutes in gold and silver. It's a fascination of mine for all my life. Mm. Flute builder. Mm -hmm. Well, I've always been a bit of a frustrated architect and it seems like in terms of leaving a useful legacy, um, buildings are gonna be uh, built and I look at so many of them and I just shake my head and think, what were they thinking? Any team sport, just not good at it, no, not interested. Hmm. Something where I have to sit down for eight or ten hours a day and not move. I'm not an office worker.
ocean, the waves in the ocean. My favorite sound would be the piano. Music, all kinds of it, whether it be a drum beat, guitar sound, whatever. I don't know, maybe a phone ringing, I have no idea. Um, I like ocean waves. Uh, silence. Explosion. Moaning. Um, loud cars. The scratching of chalkboards. Sirens. Um, probably a truck horn. <laughs> Life. Probably seeing my family every night. Spending time with family. Seeing my family and friends. Yeah. Um, when I can help another person. Doing what I want to do. When I do, when I do it. When there's a lot of um, dilemmas going on in the situation, you know, a lot of hatred and confusion. Probably when I am taking a chemistry test at school. When people don't listen or ignore me. Not getting my own way. <laughs> Up next, you'll meet visual artist and teacher Sharon Silverman. Sharon is a native of Haverhill, and she knew that she would be an artist when she was in kindergarten because her teacher, Ann Crane, gave her a bucket of water and a paintbrush and suggested that she paint the wall of the school at recess. You gotta love your teachers, right? Let's visit Sharon in her downtown Haverhill studio today. I went to Ann Crane's kindergarten in Haverhill, and um, they used to have this wall on the side of their building that was light colored and I was five years old and they'd give you a little bucket of water to paint your designs in water on the wall. I thought that was the greatest thing since sliced bread and I was like five and you know everybody's on the slides and swings and I'm over there <laughs> painting the wall in water you know but I loved it and I was always like that. I knew I was going to be an artist since the time I was five and I never changed. A brand new box of huge crayons is exciting to me today as it was when I was five. I take art because it's like it encompasses everything about my life, not what I just do. It's the way I see things, the food I do, the way I travel, the way I interact with people. It's all the same. Not everybody's going to like everybody's art, but I don't worry about that. I just do whatever's in me and either people connect to it or they don't. You know? I just don't think about that at all. You know, I have to pay my bills, but I don't even think about, oh, I'm gonna paint this because it'll sell and everybody will love this. I never think like that. I just do my thing and I hope it sells. If it doesn't, I'm happy anyway. I have this romantic idea and it's just me. I love staying in one place and watching the people and the town change. And I love remembering what Haverhill was like as a little child and watching all the different things that have happened. There's a lot of creative people here that are hiding in their own little places. And I think um, there's a great energy here. I, I love that, I feed off of that. Uh, I think that everybody's given God-given talents. And I think the best way that you can say thank you for that is to be totally yourself and just do your own thing as best as you can do it. And if you do it the best way, I think that's the best thank you that you can give. I think everybody is definitely creative. Um, whether they choose to want to tap into that is their choice. I think it's a shame if they don't. Um, I don't think everybody is into art, but you can use creativity in, in absolutely any field. My own mind thinks constantly of what if, what if, what if, why can't I do this, what if, what I what if. Everything has to be very like organized and kind of quiet because my mind works so fast and I'm inspired by everything. But I actually, I rarely put on music when I work and I, I have silence. Sometimes I just come in here and I sit on the couch and I think for two hours. That's it. I don't do, that's my, that's my creative day and I just think and I have, little books that I keep and when an idea comes I, I write it in that book and I'll, I'll keep it by my bedside when I sleep and sometimes like in the middle of the night I'm like oh I, I have to do that and I'll write it in the book there'll be times that I'll work for four hours and I'll throw it away when I'm done 
um, which my family always like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I'm like, I, I learned something from this. So it's not a waste, but that's just the way I work. Um, but sometimes right before I throw it away, I pick that piece that I did like about it and it goes into the next piece. So it's never lost. It's never wasted. I'm doing a 365 day project that I started on January 1st and every day I do another piece, whether it's this big or a giant piece. I work every single day and in February I'll, I'll have the whole thing up and each day I put the, the day it is of 365 and I sign it and I put it away. Um, but what's really interesting is when I first started it, it was very controlled and very much what I knew. And I'm like, well, I'll start here and I'll see what happens. Um, as it, it's gone on now a long time, I really started experimenting a lot with things that I've never done before. And the work is way more interesting, I think, and I, I've grown. But it'll be really fun on the wall to just watch the progression of how you think. And that's what I'm looking. I'm only going to do it one time, <laughs> one time only, because it's a huge project that takes a lot of discipline to do. At first, when I was going to do the 365 day project, I thought, well, maybe I'll keep it all the same size or maybe I'll do all the same medium. So it'll sort of look the same. And I'm like, ah, that'll be boring. I'll just do whatever I feel like doing that day. I work in all mediums. I do sculpture and photography and, and painting and drawing. So I decided like, if I feel like doing collage that day, I'll do collage. If I feel like doing photography, I'll do photography. But it's all, it's all me, so it's all connected. And that's what's really strange about it. It doesn't matter what the medium is. You can still see how I'm thinking, no matter what thing I happen to pick up that day. I like the challenge, definitely. It, it has me going in these really strange directions, but I, I, I think it's so much more exciting. I've really come into a lot of really interesting work because now I, you get past that point where you're stifled a little bit. And now it's really getting into something that I don't even have words for, really. It just sort of comes out and it's really, really strange, but it's really cool. I joined the male art community in 1980, and it's actually a philosophy of artists all around the world. To do a piece of art and to send it out free, just art for art's sake, and I absolutely love that. And I did uh, the Face of Jesus exhibition, and everyone told me I couldn't do a project like that. They said, oh, I can't do Jesus, and I said, why not? Why can't I? And gallery owners wouldn't touch it. A lot of them said, nope, it has to do with Jesus, I don't want to do it. And I, I thought that was really sad, but I was so happy that my own hometown had a gallery owner, Hamka Lawrence at Angles and Art, that said, I'll let you do it. I was thrilled for that. So I put the call out and I didn't know if I was going to get 10 pieces or 100 pieces. I got 600 pieces sent in from 42 different countries and 41 states in the United States. Hamka had it for three months at her place where hundreds of people saw the exhibition and then um, it moved on to uh, the National Shrine at La Salette where it's up to 800 plus pieces from around the world. I ran the Keystone Club, which um, brought kids of different nationalities and backgrounds together because I saw a lot of sometimes clashes because people don't understand their individual cultures. So we brought all these kids together and all of a sudden um, the animosity went away. We went out and we tried different foods and learned different languages and appreciated the artwork and music of different cultures. They did do a project that I'm really proud of called Soli Our Heritage. Um, it was both boys and girls that worked on that. Uh, we interviewed the old factory workers from Haverhill. Um, they're in their 80s and 90s now. A lot of them have passed away since that documentary. So to get their stories, the kids wrote their own questions. They were hilarious. Not only was it important to get the history down, but um, the elderly gave their words of advice to the young people and they also talked about their own problems that they went through during their times. So kids kind of got in perspective that, you know, even though there's hard times, you can make it through it because all these people did. It captured that time in history and those stories would have been lost because a lot of people have since passed away. It was something that I was really proud of because um, 
they started wanting to give back to the community. They came together like brothers, like real brothers. Kindness. Can't. Uh, people who are very real and act as they really are and don't put up any masks. That's, that's awesome to me. No matter who they are, I love that and I think it's funny and I enjoy people that are like that. Uh, people who use others, people who are cruel to others, I don't think there's any need of that in any circumstance whatsoever. So um, users and, and just people who are cruel, they don't, whether they do it on purpose or they, they don't do it on purpose, it, it really doesn't matter to me. I think we have a free choice and uh, you can choose to be kind or you can choose to be a jerk. And uh, I don't like it when people choose the latter. Silence. I don't know, sometimes on the street you'll hear people just yelling um, at each other and there's, there's kind of that vibration. You know, I'm trying to be creative sometimes or um, I tend to take in everything around me. So I, I, I feel sad when I hear that kind of like violence or, you know, people swearing or, or being angry at each other. I don't, I don't like to listen to that. Uh, writer, a writer. Absolutely not politics. Um, well done, good and faithful servant. Thanks for joining us. Part of what we do at Creative Haverhill is to identify, nurture, and promote our local talent. They make up today's and tomorrow's creative workforce that helps drive economic development. Throughout history, artists have always led the way in changing societies, and Creative Haverhill is leading that charge. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Just type in Creative Haverhill. you find us everywhere. Have a creative day. I would love to be a musician. Astronaut. A uh, lawyer. An attorney. Be a vet. A veterinarian. A professional hockey player. Firefighter. I would be an astronaut. A uh, singer. Professional athlete. Be a fireman. I would like to be a doctor. A martial arts school owner. I probably would not want to be a janitor. A septic tank cleaner. <laughs> I guess it would be to pick up animal dung. Waste management. A doctor. A doctor. A nurse. Or EMT. A construction worker. I wouldn't like an office seat. I'm not that type of person.